So, how many people flew here? This week? Wow, that's fantastic. How many people drove? Okay, I took the train. So, there's this classic um, risk perception joke that people are far more terrified to get onto a plane than they are to get into a car, uh, even though they're far they're significantly more likely to get into a fatal car crash. Sorry for all of you that drive. I don't want to scare you going home. That's why I took the train. Uh, then getting into a fatal plane crash, right? So if I had to relate that in some way to WordPress, I would use spam. And that is convenient for me this morning, standing in front of you fine individuals. So if you think about and I don't even have to ask for a show of hands. I know for a fact that the vast majority of folks in this room, myself included, are far more concerned about some kind of security vulnerability being exposed or um, exploited on their site than they are about a spammer interacting it with some way, even though the latter is far more likely to, uh, to actually occur. So that's kind of part of the, the basis for um, my talk here today. So one of the things you're gonna hear often this weekend is that WordPress powers 25% of the internet, which, yeah, which is absolutely mind blowing. It's incredible, it's fantastic. Uh, from my perspective, it means that the WordPress ecosystem has, uh, has a target on its back larger than ever before, and it's continuing to grow in, in terms, with regards to spammers. Uh, so it's a real threat. So if you think about just the entry, the sheer amount of entry points uh, that kind of that kind of converge into the the WordPress ecosystem and community. It's really astounding. You think of things like your vanilla comments, where it all began. You think of things like external plugins that allow new and exciting forms of user input. Think about a third-party plugin service, uh, something like a Discuss or an Intense Debate uh, that specific targets uh, that specific spammers actually target. Uh, you think of things like user registration, profile data, uh, contact forms, obviously. So even if you don't have a blog, right, there's still an entry point there. And even if you think of, of, of BuddyPress, so I can tell you for sure that a, an abandoned BuddyPress site's activity stream is a spammer's dream. And there are quite a few of them out there. And even forums. So uh, spammers who target forums tend to be completely different than those that target something like blog comments, but because of things like BB press and, and other forum things that, that allow you to, to turn your WordPress site into um, a forum, that these, these spammers are still interacting with, with the WordPress ecosystem. So again, it's a real threat. And I promised some numbers in my presentation description, even though probably not a lot of people read that, and that's okay, because uh, the name kind of sends it all. Um, and so one of the big ones is the percentage of content submissions identified as spam over the past three years. 2013, nearly 50 billion content submissions, 94% were spam. 2014, nearly 100 billion content submissions, 96% were spam. In 2015, pro I projected obviously, because it's not over yet, nearly 80 billion content submissions, 98% will be identified as spam. Uh, so obviously I hate to see what, what happens next year. Um, but obviously there, there, there's more and more spam as, as we continue here. Um, so one of the things that I like to look at if I, if I really wanna gauge kind of how spam's affecting uh, the WordPress ecosystem, it's in the quality of things like false positive reports, right? Because this is a direct, um, kind of indication of how folks are actually viewing content that's, that's being added to their site by, by some third party. In 2013, so I will say that these are reports that are determined via code at response time to be very low quality, meaning that they come from sources or reporters that are very, have a very low reputation in reporting these kinds of things. You'd be surprised at some of the things that come back as, as false positives. Um, whether they're legitimately or they're just messing around or whatever. Uh, from 36 million in 2013, now if I actually looked through uh, a kind of a, an enormous amount of false positive reports, I can find many more million that were very low quality, but this is just something that we can easily measure. 
Uh, so from 36 million in 2013 all the way down to 5 million in 2015 as a projected number. And that is absolutely fantastic. That means people are getting smarter about the content that they're seeing on their sites. And if I take it a step further, in 2013, 90% of false positive reports were deemed to be low quality. And that number is down to 58% in 2015. So again, this is fantastic. It's fantastic news for us, the WordPress community, uh, and bad news for spammers. Now, if I flip the coin and look at missed spam. So miss spam report, low quality miss spam reports, generally speaking, these are things like, it's not a technical term, but trolls. So think about a liberal political news site and a conservative commenter wants to leave his two cents and that per the site owner discards that as spam uh, and he leaves you know thousands and thousands of comments. It's all discarded as spam, but it's not technically spam, okay? It, it kind of falls into a different bucket of, of unwanted content. Uh, but this has decreased as well. So this has gone from 108 million in 2013 down to about 97 million uh, this year. Not a huge drop, but it's not as significant as what we're seeing on the false positive side of things, which I deem to be far more important. And just looking at the percentages, this has actually gone up recently. 95% uh, of missed spam reports this year will be deemed to be low quality. Uh, and like I said, the majority of those are kind of just various unwanted uh, content that may not actually fit into the, the perfect spam bucket. So ultimately, we have a three-year reporting trust increase with users, and this is fantastic. So this is, this is really good news for, for, for the ecosystem as a whole. People are getting more intelligent about what they're seeing on their sites. Uh, and just a quick note on seasonality, since we are in that time of the year, over 35% of spam occurs in the fourth quarter. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So you think about sports, NFL, NBA, NHL, so which is a huge source of live streaming spam and jersey spam and things like that. Uh, big movies coming out. You think of things like The Hunger Games always come out this time of the year. Uh, Star Wars, obviously, is a, is a big topic of spam uh, and getting there. Uh, then you have things like Christmas, you have Black Friday, holidays, everything like that. So it, it, it makes sense. So we're in the spammiest time of the year for sure. So those are just kind of raw numbers, not that, not terribly interesting. So, but how has spam actually evolved over that time, over the past three years? Something fascinating about working in spam is that it changes every second of every single day. And uh, the, the changes from month to month, year to year are actually more interesting and more apparent. So new generic TLDs, people have heard of these. And so we've started to see these surface more and more. So you have things like when they came out, we were kind of bracing ourselves for impact because the barriers to entry in some of them were very low. So you have like dot top domains. I think they cost like two bucks a year. So obviously a really good opportunity for a spammer looking for a new domain. Uh, then there's other ones like .xyz, and these numbers, 20,000, 10,000, are spam appearances per hour on average. And you have other ones like .club, .space, .science, kind of uh, on the low end of things. And so they're not much of a factor yet, and that's the big part, is they will be, because more and more keep coming out, and as the barriers to entry stay low, then I think spammers will, will start to move there. Now, I will say this, for what it's worth, I have yet to see a comment linking to any of those sites or any of those sorts of domains that is not spam. So I think really before they really start to catch on, I think people are going to be mentally trained, at least I hope so, to think that's a dot top domain that is absolute spam, no matter what it says. So I think that's a good thing that's happening right now. So I, I'll just kind of let them keep doing it. Uh, one of the big things is the continued rise of the human spammer. So human spam is much more difficult, as you may have guessed, to detect and stop than bot-generated spam, which tends to be pretty terrible. So this is, as it's more effective, we're seeing more and more of it, there are armies of people employed to sit at a computer for eight hours a day and just submit spam. And as it's more difficult to detect, as resources allow, we're seeing more and more shops actually using uh, this method. Increased targeting. The top 10% of daily active sites make 90% of the requests. The top 1% of daily active sites make 70% of the requests. So over the past five years, I'll say that we've seen the distribution of spam amongst the entire WordPress ecosystem change. And spammers are getting much better about targeting things. Has anyone had a post that's gone viral? 
Come on, don't be shy. I know you have. Okay, and so, and some of you may have experienced this, the spammers will latch themselves on to a viral post or a very popular post or even just a very popular site. And they're targeting more and more and they've been doing that more than they ever have been before. And that's, that's been certainly a trend. Um, one of my favorites, maximum obfuscation. So as you can see from the comment here, uh, what we're seeing in a lot of new spam and particularly in the human generated form is ASCII and Unicode confusable characters as well as non-printing characters and things of that nature. So if you see the comment there, obviously they might think that it's difficult for a piece of software to detect what it's actually saying. Uh, but for the naked human eye, you can actually tell exactly what it's saying. And so that's the interesting thing. And this is very, as I said, this is very popular amongst human spammers. So payload host, so where does spam live? So this is the tip of the iceberg. This is just a very quick and narrow glimpse into where we find that spam actually lives on the internet. So we have some big sites and communities, webs.com, YouTube, Facebook, 20,000 spam appearances plus per hour on average. Uh, Tumblr and Reddit kind of at the, the bottom end of things. Reddit's very popular amongst live streaming spam for whatever reason. And there's one in the middle there that I highlighted in orange. I didn't want to call them out, so I removed the domain name. But it's an abandoned, I guess it's abandoned, it's a hacked WordPress site. And it accounts for approximately 10,000 uh, con spam comments per hour. So it's not the owners of the site, but it was hacked by spammers. And they basically put their play payload there in various URLs, they're selling cigarettes. And they bomb the internet with links to that site. Uh, so that is, and this is not uncommon. So I'd say that the possibly the majority of payload sites that we see are actually kind of fall into this bucket. And as you may know, that hacked WordPress sites and really any site for that matter, not just WordPress, make fantastic payload hosts. So update, 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 make sure you're running the most current versions of your software, plugins, be aware of any security vulnerabilities and things like that. If you shut down a site, shut it down properly. Don't, don't just kind of leave it there to die by itself and, and something like that happens. Um, so just kind of a, be re a responsible WordPress user and you don't have nothing to worry about. So one of the fun things we like to do, and it doesn't change often, so I guess it's not as fun as it used to be, but uh, we actually look at kind of what are the most common words in, in spam comments. And so this is just a very quick glimpse. This is, so you can see kind of trends, right? So we have Cialis, we have Isabel Morant, we have Viagra, we have DVD box sets, Montclair jackets, Ralph Lauren polo, Canada goose, UGG Australia, cheap. Uh, Michael Kors outlet share, which I believe means expensive in French, not the not the singer. I think that's true. If we have any, it is. It, it means expensive in French. Uh, if we break it down by actual numbers, uh, so spam appearances per hour: DVD 3.4 million, Ralph Lauren, cheap, Montclair, Michael Kors, all over a million per hour. Cialis, Viagra, and uh, Christian Louboutin, I believe it's pronounced. It's the red bottom shoe guy. Very popular. And so basically what this means is fashion knockoffs and prescription drugs are still the most prevalent spam topics, for sure. So there's a lot of new ones, new funky ones that I'll get to in a little bit, but uh, by far and away, these are the most common. And these are mainly the spray and pray flavor of spam where it's just let's hammer as many sites as possible with as many comments as possible and see what sticks. So one of the, I guess one of the first spam emails I ever got was from a Nigerian prince, right? And a uh, very generous man, obviously. And so the prince still exists, but he's transformed a little bit. He's morphed into different things. And so these are, this is kind of a quick glimpse on some of the new forms of spam that we can expect. Uh, moving forward and some that we've been seeing over the past few years gain a lot of traction. So professional hackers. So I guess people who are very good with computers uh, and the internet want to offer to either erase uh, criminal records or create criminal records against a personal rival or perhaps a jaded love interest. Usually they provide an email, usually like a Skype ID or some kind of instant messaging thing. I don't know what happens when you actually get in touch with them. 
the fake technical support has anyone seen this so this is this is super scary to me because i actually had an extended family member get had by this and it's usually a john non-geographic phone number so an 855 and what happens is they very they target product support communities so they they're very well targeted and they're very well placed so their placement's very good and basically they'll they'll get you to call them and they'll either like take your computer hostage or they'll sell you some kind of bogus software and things like that uh, so th th those are kind of scary vampires so ever since twilight became a thing vampire spam uh, was also a thing and it's been increasing over the past few years I will say uh, and these are folks who deem that they can turn you into a vampire now we laugh but if it didn't work they wouldn't do it so take that with you throughout the weekend <laughs> and I haven't seen any vampires yet am I right now I have a toddler so I don't go out at night but I'm just saying I have not seen any vampires Korean mega spam uh, this is also kind of fun. So they target very big sites and big forum communities. Uh, it's, there's t it's two flavors. It's usually a domain or a phone number. This is the domain flavor. The domain is usually a mixture of letters and numbers, and it's very it's usually very heavily obfuscated. The topics, if translated, uh, go to things like prostitution, massage parlors, which I guess is the same thing. Um, what else? Uh, casinos, gambling things of that nature and this is just the phone number flavor of it it's usually a zero one zero phone number also usually heavily obfuscated drug delivery so different from the viagras and cialises of the world they they promote a uh, delivery service for top medical marijuana strains usually or things like adderall or codeine it's usually a phone number or an email address usually lots of repetition they tend to target more youthful sites like kind of think game communities and things like that. Um, and so usually a lot of reputation. The, the, the phone number is usually obfuscated in some way depending on how, on, on the particular spammer. So that's, and I, so I will say that I also have a story about when we called, um, I was actually with um, some, some uh, Kismet colleagues earlier this year, and we actually we found a comment on one of our sites that was from a gentleman who said that he could uh, get, get back our estranged wife, and we actually called him and had a conversation with him for like half the day. So I didn't work that into my presentation, but if you want to hear about it, you can ask it in the Q&A. So that's basically what's been happening, um, what's been going on in the past few five years. Uh, so what happens next? And really, it's it's much of the same, right? So more human. So it's, as it's more effective, people are going to use it more. The rise of the new generic TLDs, as I talked about, there's going to be more and more that come out. And I think they continue to be really good opportunities for spammers. More gimmicks. Ten years ago, vampires spam didn't exist. Now it does. Uh, better user judgment. This is the silver lining of the day, I think. I think people are getting smarter about what they're seeing, and I think they're making better decisions, and that is a very, very, very good thing. Uh, increased obfuscation. So as I said, that that's going to continue for sure because you'd be surprised at the ways they come up to obscure things. It's, it's, it's really fantastic. And if I could leave you with something, the most scary part, or the scariest part, is mo more direct human contact. So think about the tech support pad. And I think anytime you encounter a situation where there is a trained con artist, right, which is a spammer, reaching out for direct human contact with some individual who is in need of something, I think it's a very dangerous situation. So you're going to hear a lot this weekend about contributing to WordPress. You're going to hear about contributing code, documentation, uh, accessibility tests and all those wonderful things and you should you should contribute everything you can to the community so but I'll, and I'll give you one more and that's if you're setting up a site a new site for a client for a new WordPress user family member friend niece nephew whatever just drop like five lines in there about spam okay uh, you know you know kind of the trends now you know what's happening what to expect tell them what to expect make them aware of things and I think if that happens more with new, with first time kind of WordPress users and site owners, then I think really the community as a whole and the ecosystem as a whole is, 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 is much better off.
And obviously, you can expect more spam as well. It's not going anywhere, right? It's it's as certain in this life as taxes, death, and Chris Pratt. You know, you just you want to you want to get away from them so badly, but man, they're just they're just always there. So, uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you today. So, if anyone has any questions, more than happy to to field those at this time. Hey Anthony, hello. Uh, you mentioned that if you close a site, you should close it properly. Could you elaborate on that and give people more concrete examples? Yeah. So if you, I mean, who here has closed a site before, right? Like, yeah. I mean, maybe a business shut or you just lost interest in a blog or something like that. And I think a lot of times we're just like, well, I don't care about it anymore. You know, I have like 15 sites under this hosting account. I'm just gonna let it kind of sit there and die. And so really what you should do is, I mean, if you have significant traffic coming to it, right? Like it all, it's all going to depend. Then just kind of set it into some sort of a maintenance mode. You know, there's plugins for that, obviously. And just, you know, enable auto updates, just keep all your plugins updated, things like that. And there are services that, you know, help you with that. So do that or just remove it from the internet. Just get rid of it. You know, like literally, I mean, delete, you know, like literally just, you know, FTP into it and into your hosting account and literally just get rid of it entirely. Or maybe just like save a local copy if maybe you want to maintain it for, you know, you, you know, down the road. So either basically completely remove it from the Internet or put it into a maintenance mode where it is always going to be updated. But don't leave something there that could become vulnerable right, to something that, that occurs and, you know, it could be attacked by hackers. And if someone knows that you own that site or something like that, it, 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 it's a very bad uh, scenario, you know, for you, for, for, for people who actually are reading your site or something like that. So just, just close it in a responsible way. Hi. Um, really great talk, by the way. Thank um, you. So uh, I deal with a lot of clients who are, they don't, they aren't technical people at all, uh, obviously. And, uh, and we always, I always you know, tell them about spam. Uh, and so the, the question they always ask, especially if they're dealing with a lot of spam, um, and the question they always ask is why do, like obviously I'm not gonna click on these links or whatever, obviously this is spam. Number one, why do they do this? What are they after? And, and I get this might be a sophomore question, but like apart from the human issue of these people who could be you know, taken advantage of in the comments or whatever, and then obviously certain search engine, op search engine issues, are there also vulnerability issues? And to what extent are the vulnerability issues when it comes to spam? So, so three parts why do they do it? Um, so really it's, so they do it to, for, for some kind of monetary gain, right? At some point there's a monetary gain and that might not be immediately obvious, but at some point it's to get you to another site, to get you to call one of these vampire people. Um, and at some point get money from you for some kind of a service, whether it be bogus, whether it be, you know, illegal, whether it be not real, um, such as the vampire service, but you know, it's, it, so that's really, that's really why they do it. Now, a lot of times you see spam and we're a lot of smart people in this room. So we see it and we're like, oh my God, that is so obviously spam, but it's not obvious to everybody. And it's the law of numbers, right? It's basically let's, th you know, if you throw a few million spam comments out there, if you have a bot that generates a few million spam comments, if you get maybe, and you do that in within the course of like five minutes, if you get three people to respond, that might be a good day. Uh, so it's the law of numbers. Um, so what other kind of vulnerabilities exist? So really, so there, you mentioned kind of SEO. So SEO is one of them and I didn't mention that, but you know, if you have a ton of spam comments on your site, and you know, linking to kind of other sites that are known to be spam or sketchy, then it's not good for your site, right? So obviously you wanna keep it as clean as possible. Um, in terms of vulnerabilities, you know, it depends what they're linking to as well. If they're linking to something like malware or something similar that's on, that exists on your site, 
Uh, obviously, you know, browsers could maybe warn users about that site, uh, which would be your site at that point. And, you know, if a user clicks on it and then something bad happens to them, it's, it's things like that that you really have to watch out for that I would say that kind of is the, the secondary problem with uh, or concern about allowing spam comments. And really, the more content that you let on your site, the, more, the bigger chance there is to, for something to slip through. And that's why we're seeing increased targeting, like I said. Because if you throw a million comments at one post, it's entirely possible that, that a few might get through and something like that might happen. Thanks. Sure. So I have a question that kind of flips this on its head. Um, what can we do to waste their time and their resources? <laughs> can we call those phone numbers and waste their time so, and make it not possible, make it not? So I'm gonna tell you that story now. So I was with uh, a Kismet colleagues, and this is really if you have a lot of free time on your hands. We were in Florida, we were just hanging out. So, um, so, we, so some gentleman left a spam comment on a site, and he said he would get back our estranged wife. Now, you know, we were all happily married, but uh, we thought that this would be a good uh, time to, to get involved with, with this gentleman. So uh, we called the gentleman via Skype. There was a gentleman in India. And uh, he literally was, you know, telling us that he would help us get our wife back. And we basically said, you know, well, our wife, she left for work this morning. We don't know if she's coming back. We want to make sure she comes back. And we were literally engaged for like three hours with this man. And it basically it came to the point where he used, he, we found out his secret, which is he uses a magic mirror to get our wife back. So he needed like a picture of her her date of birth, like really scary stuff. Like we were going to send it to this guy on Skype because our wife went to work. So then eventually we, we got to the point where we asked if we could just buy the mirror because she goes to work every day. Like, so uh, we don't want to have to do this every day. This is ridiculous. Like, can we just buy the magical mirror from you? And he got really offended, like super offended. And he basically like hung up on us before he got our credit card information or the picture of our wife, like our dog's names, anything. And so we called back later and we basically got through like a half hour again with him using just the Arnold Schwarzenegger soundboard. Um, and, you know, like, cause you can just do yes. Cause like they, they ask a lot of questions. So it's like after everyone, it's like, yes, you know, yes. And he has no idea, he's clueless. Uh, so that is a one way to waste their time. It really is. Uh, call, call one of the numbers, you know, calling a number, it's not gonna do anything, right? You gotta, you know, just don't give them the credit card information. But yeah, uh, he got really offended. He was really serious about his work. I admired him. But yeah, so that is, that is a really good way to, to, to waste their time, for sure. And that's really about all that you can do, for sure. Hi, I'm Kelly. Hi. Um, so I find the biggest uh, problem with comment spam, especially, is that I don't uh, allow it to go through unless it's monitored, and so a lot of it, and especially in my client sites, backs up in the back. It's just like there's thousands of them. So is that does that create any kind of vulnerability other than annoy, being annoying? And how do you feel about the Honeypot project to deal with spam? Uh, so, so if they're not actually publishing on the site, it's not a huge deal. But I mean, obviously, if you have a ton of comments piling up in your database or something like that. Uh, it's not good. It can make the site the site slow, you know, which causes experience issues and things like that. Um, so that would probably be the main problem. Seeing something like that happen, you'd probably want some kind of a service that just discards them um, immediately, so they're actually not hitting any kind of database. Anytime a spam comment doesn't hit your database is a really good day. If someone leaves a spam comment on your site and it never really reaches anything, that's a really good day. So if you find a service that does that, I think that's that that's a really good step. Uh, but other than that, nothing really to worry about other than just kind of it makes your DB slow and, and things like that, depending on how many it is. Uh, honeypot projects, I think, are great. I think natural honeypots are even better, whereas if there's – we we see this really often is that there might be a abandoned WordPress site that gets hammered with spam and it basically it becomes a honeypot for us because we can see kind of these bots just attacking this site and we didn't even set it up it's just an abandoned uh or hacked site or something like that but yeah super helpful hi i just wanted to um 
of course, thank you for the presentation and the You're numbers. Welcome. Believe it or not, I'm a numbers person, so that Good. was really interesting. And I wanted to share some of my experience with spam because I've had a lot of spam on my blogs. And one of the plugins that you didn't mention earlier was the Comment Love plugin. I don't know if anybody's ever familiar with this. Not hmm. popular now, but it used to be really popular. A lot of bloggers wanted that plugin, and some still use it actually, um, even though the developer, he, uh, Andy Bailey, he's got MS now, so I don't know if he's keeping it up. But it would it was a thing where you could leave a link to your last blog post in your comment, and that attracted a lot of spam because mm -hmm. what would happen is there would be all these bloggers that would have these lists of the 100 most popular comment love blog blogs mm. and I got rid of the comment love, love plugin about three years ago but I'm still on all these lists mm -hmm. so these folks come over you know they're targeting my blog because they're trying to get a link and of course, they're hiring folks to do all this commenting, so they don't even notice that they're not getting the link. And I think the other way that, um, to answer the other question earlier, why do they do it? The other way that they get traffic is because there is, on the, you know, the native WordPress commenting block, there is a way, a spot for them to leave their blog link. Mm -hmm. So as a blogger, you want to peruse your comments and just take a look. Well, now they do have a little hover that'll show the website, but sometimes you click on that link. So if you figure if there's thousands and thousands of these comments out there, thousands of bloggers that are like, hmm, let me just click on that site. So they get traffic that way. And the last thing I just wanted to say was, I actually have these people calling me on the phone uh, that want to do Windows support. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's scary. I don't so, like yeah. that stuff. Oh, yeah, I really don't. The, the say, fake tech support is scary. Oh yeah, they say. Oh, yeah, I really don't like that um, stuff. Oh, I'm calling about your Windows computer. And I'm like. I, I think it's very successful spam. Yeah. I think they're very yeah. successful. I think so yeah. too. And they also want to um, send me the drugs. The. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, sure. I mean, why not, right? The Viagra. They, 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 you know, you could be a vampire. It's it's really yeah. So I did full service. I've done something a little similar to what you guys did one day when I had a little free time. They call and they say, you know, I want to help you, you know, or we want to call about your Windows computer. I'm like, huh? Ma'am, we're calling about your Windows computer. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and I just keep going. Yeah, huh? yeah. you can, you can easily so waste their finally. time. And they'll, they'll stay on the phone with you all day. Or, or sometimes yeah. they actually curse at you and say, you, uh, you know. The <laughs> guy really got offended when we asked for the magical mirror. Just keep going, huh? I don't think he had a magic mirror. I think that was why he got offended. Okay, one uh, thing that might be able to fundamentally change this picture is if uh, you're running a forum, say, or a blog that allows comments, if you could have a system to set up to, say, charge a penny or a nickel for each uh, submission that, uh, that you ever saw, uh, is, is, has anything been done along that line? I don't think so. No. Any idea um, not? I mean, mainly because you never want to punish the good people, you know. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of the most important things in stopping spam is doing so in a way that doesn't harm uh, genuine interaction, you know, because I think that's really the lifeblood of, of the Internet and blogs and everything. So you never want to do anything to damage that. Uh, yes, you that, um, you mentioned about uh, uh, um, things that went viral. If you publish something that went viral and that attracted spam, um, I'm planning to publish something on one of the online uh, sites, and uh, I'm debating about in the bio whether to put a link to you know, obviously my email. <laughs> Is this thing even on? To my email, or uh, even to put uh, the name of our company, because in both cases. Now they know, a my email, yeah. or b they know my company. Will that sort of thing the, attract spammers to our company? Yes, site? they never publish your email. That's absolutely going to attract. Put them. my email. What if I just put my link to my company? Uh, I wouldn't do it. I, I would just link them to like a contact form, like a site on like a page on your site that has a contact form. 
Because that way you can also control the information you get mm -hmm. and not just kind of just leave an email out there. Um, so that, that's what I would do in that situation. Okay, but the second question, I don't think I was clear. Um, if I just put a link to our website, will they, will the fact that it's been online attract them to come look at our website? Uh, it might, but I mean, I think it's, I think your link's fine. I think your link is totally fine. Uh, it's not, you're not going to see like an enormous influx of spam just because of that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much.